we're going to leap forward, back to the future style, um, from classic cars to uh, the, the very future of, of personal transport. Um, we have Dr. Mike Jump here from Liverpool University, and he's the principal investigator on two European Commission funded projects, uh, Aristotle and Mycopter. And uh, he's going to be giving us a pretty revolutionary view of future transport. So please welcome him, Dr. Mike Jump. So, can you hear me? You can. Fantastic. Um, well, hang on, I've got to start my watch because I know time is, uh, time is key. Um, I'm Mike Jump, I'm a lecturer in uh, aerospace engineering at the University of Liverpool. Um, and when I was invited to speak, uh, I went onto the 5x15 website to see who else has been sort of invited and who, uh, who's spoken at these sorts of events. And I'm pleased to report I am the least famous, least decorated and least published of all the speakers. So if you need to go to the toilet or go to the bar, now would be the time to do it. All right. I'm also a double imposter, really. Uh, I've uh, spent all of my career as an aerospace engineer and here I am talking at a motoring event. So uh, I apologise in advance, but I'm hoping that in the future we will be able to bring the two disciplines together, automotive and aerospace, to, uh, to um, well, I'm going to say the words, the flying car. I'm going to try and avoid that, all right. Um, I've said I'm a lecturer, so some of you might have the fear. Some of you might still be at university, some of you will have been to university. And so I promise that I won't get any more complicated than anything that's on the board at the moment. So where do we be uh, begin? Um, the start is usually a good place. So those of you that are observers of aeroplanes and the air transport industry might think that it's stagnated, that innovation in the uh, aerospace industry is stagnated. Aircraft that were designed three, four, five years ago look very much like their um, uh, forebears from 50 or 60 years ago. So the 747, for example, I've just happened to pick on that. I'm sorry, Boeing. Um, the 747-8, which is mainly used as a freighter rather than a transporter, um, looks very much like the 747-100 of 40 years previously. And if you're into helicopters, the Merlin, which is currently in service, doesn't look that different from uh, a Sea King. Of course, this, this sort of superficial lack of innovation does mask um, lots of innovation that's gone on at what you might call the subsystem level. So engines are much more efficient, um, so you get more fuel efficiency. Uh, we use a lot of carbon fibre composites, so you have a more structural efficiency. And of course, we use lots of computational tools that we didn't have 40, 50 years ago. So hopefully we have more aerodynamic efficiency. Uh, nevertheless, um, we know that uh, the demand for travel is going to increase, the population's increasing, resources uh, or fossil fuel resources are decreasing. So more of what we do today, tomorrow, isn't going to be good enough. We're going to have to do something different. Um, and to that end, the, uh, the European Commission uh, commissioned a study called Out of the Box, where they took the great and the good from the aerospace industry, the air transport industry, and they came up with 100 what I've called wacky ideas. And those were distilled down to the six best and perhaps most likely. And I'm here to talk about one of those, which is a personal aerial transport system and the role of personal aerial vehicles in that transport system. Uh, I should say that uh, it's not just me, so the project is called Mycopter and it's actually a European consortium. Um, so there's ourselves, uh, some German research institutes and some uh, Swiss research institutes, so I'm, I couldn't be here without them, uh, I'm not doing all of the work. In fact, some of my researchers might say I'm not doing any of the work. Um, so, so far so good, right? But what have we got to do with motoring? Well, today, of course, we know that we have a problem. So here are some statistics which you should view with the usual caution when someone's trying to tell you something. So 6.7 billions of gasoline is what's estimated to be wasted in the US due to traffic jams. Okay? And 100 billion euros is what's estimated to be wasted from European GDP uh, in, in congestion. One and a half people is the average number of people in a car uh, which are generally designed for four or five people. So on the commute, there's on average one and a half people in a car. And just in case you in the southeast think you have the monopoly on bad traffic, 50 hours is the amount of time that you generally spend waiting in traffic in London. And in Manchester, where I'm from, it's 70 hours. All right? So we know we have a problem. We don't, you're probably all drivers. I don't need to tell you there's a problem. Um, so one of the, uh, the possible solutions, and it's one of a number of possible solutions, I'm not saying it's the solution and I'm not trying to really predict the future, is that we take some of those people off the road and put them into the air. And that makes things better for them, 
and makes things better for those of us left on the road. So what sort of issues are we tackling in the project? And perversely, I'm going to tell you exactly what we're not doing. Right? So we're not doing a detailed design or even a preliminary or a conceptual design of a flying car. At the end of this project in 2014, I'm not going to be standing here going, ta-da, right? I promise you. Uh, what we're looking at is a personal aerial transportation system, we're trying to envision that, that step change in how we're going to travel in the future and the role of personal aerial vehicles in that system. But I'm an engineer, okay, so I can't talk about fluffy stuff. I have to have something to think about. So obviously we've had to put some structure into the project and we've structured it around three themes and a reference um, scenario. So the three themes are um, human-machine interface or interaction, so how we will interact with that vehicle. Um, it's autonomy or automation, so how, much, how many automatic systems need to go in or does the vehicle actually need to be autonomous and that's a debate in itself. Just defining that difference between automation and autonomy amongst academics could take us the rest of our lives. And what's called socio-technological -technolo studies. So one of the partners is going to look at the, the social aspects of this. So clearly, if this were to happen, it's going to make a massive impact on our society. And we're going to look at the issues about how acceptable people, you know, how people would use this system, how acceptable they would find it, and so on. And the reference scenario we've picked is, the, what is probably the obvious one, which is the commute. So that's where all the traffic congestion problems generally are. So we're aiming at a commuter market. Um, it's uh, going to be a one plus one, you might say. So generally we're expecting one person to be commuting in it. But at the weekend, to get away from the tedium of the farm in the Midwest, you might take your wife, partner, husband or other beloved uh, in the back of it, uh, similar to a motorbike, I guess. They would have a range of between 60 and 100 miles, typical sort of commute distances, and maybe 100 to 150 miles an hour. They would operate point to point, critically. So they would operate like your car. So you would walk out your door in the morning and get into the, the, the personal aerial vehicle in the drive uh, and take you to your destination. So there wouldn't be any messing about in between waiting at stations, for example. But to do that, one of the key requirements is that you'd have to have some kind of vertical lift capability, right? Because you, you're not going to want to be taking off down your street. Um, well, you might, you might want to do that, but we don't, <laughs> we don't think you will. Um, and if I can just turn my page over, I know I'm not supposed to have notes, I apologise. Um, and what we would want it to be, of course, is as available as a personal car. It's no use it being available one day a week, because what do you do for the rest of the week? And of course, it would have to operate in conditions like this, which are quite challenging for a conventional aircraft, so rain, hail, snow, fog at night, and so on. They would also be operating at low level, which is right out of the way of current air traffic, but right in the way of general aviation and birds and all the rest of it. So we'll have to worry about scraping more than flies off your windscreen, perhaps. Bird strikes are a serious threat to aircraft at low level. And we'd also envisage, perhaps, um, a, uh, a phased approach. So um, in the same way that I guess that cars used to have a man in, walking in front of them with a red flag, we envisage that perhaps the first iteration of a personal aerial transport system would have a sort of taxi service. So you would have a semi-trained operator doing the inputs while you were flown to work. Eventually, they will become truly personal uh, in the same way that cars are today. So of the three themes, Liverpool are involved primarily at the moment, at least, in the human-machine interaction. So I'm going to just talk for the rest of the time a little bit about that. Um, so I've mentioned this phased approach. And so we imagine that there might be a taxi driver. We also imagine that, as Stephen said, we don't, we don't really want to just get into a pod and fly and, and be flown to our, our workplace at the weekend or we might actually want to interact with this vehicle and go flying. Um, so uh, we need to work out how the vehicle dynamics need to work so that and it's not even the average person right, that's going to get into one of these things, it's the guy who soups up his courser at the weekend okay, that we've got to worry about, what that vehicle will have to fly like to ensure everybody's safety. So uh, we are performing a series of experiments on our simulator. Daisy, if you can press the button. So you can see we actually have two simulators. So this is just going, someone's in there crashing about, pretending to fly. Um, my wife thinks I just go to work and play on this all day. Okay, and at the moment we're using um, professional test pilots. We've adopted what's called a handling qualities approach, which we've taken from the Rotorcraft uh, uh, industry, if you like. Um, where we've, we've defined a mission, so our mission is the, um, is the trip to work, the commute to work. 
break that down into phases, so take off, climb, cruise, and so on. And then we, for experimental purposes, we have things called mission task elements. So these are small clinical maneuvers that can be repeated by different people. Um, and to, you can see you're looking a bit blank. So this is, this is uh, a mission task element called the precision hover, uh, or at least a simulation of it. So uh, what the, the pilot's task is to translate across the ground and ensure that the, uh, has this got a pointer? No, it won't work on that. There's a red ball, and he has to get the red ball in the center of the blue circle. I'll show a video in a minute, it'll become clear. All right, and that can be repeated by many, many people. So we can do measurements, which is what engineers like. So this is a pilot doing it. Daisy, sorry. And at the moment, we're using professional test pilots. Position four and up, just on the line now. I've got a good lateral transition, but obviously, I've only got a, uh, on that initial transition across. Okay, so what test pilots like to do is talk, okay, and that talking is very valuable. So we can do the experiments, we can do our mathematical models of the vehicle, but it's actually their feedback which has been most useful to date. Eventually the plan is to get guys like you and guys like me, put them in and see if our easy to fly vehicle uh, is as easy to fly as we think it is. Okay. Right, issues. Okay, so you're all sitting there thinking this guy is living in cloud cuckoo land, right? So we ha we're not approaching this naively, all right? So I'm, I'm, you know, a dour engineer who does maths and physics and makes measurements and all that, works with computers. So um, we are applying, obviously, a scientific method to this, but we're, we know there are going to be issues. The first of the issues is us, right? Um, so the general public and the acceptability of such an idea and what you might term pollution. So noise, these things are going to have to be quiet compared to today's uh, aviation products. Um, they're going to have to be less polluting. Um, fuel, of course, since we've mentioned pollution. So clearly, we're here today uh, talking about, well, we have, met, have heard mention of electric cars. So electricity is the way to go in the motoring industry. At the moment, electric power probably isn't in aviation's future because the energy density of a battery just isn't sufficient for any kind of meaningful flight, time or distance. That's not to say it will never happen. And we have a guy who basically in his back shed, uh, in its shed in his back garden, created an electric helicopter which flew for six minutes. Right? But really at the moment we would envision perhaps using biof uh, biofuels. The airlines are testing those at the moment. You may even have flown in an aeroplane that's been using biofuels. There are, of course, issues with biofuels. You need land to grow the crops to make them. You need large algal blooms. Okay? No one's quite sure whether they're as environmentally friendly as, uh, as the proponents would have you believe. I've written down regulators, and that, by that I mean safety. Okay? So we're all going to be concerned with these things flying above us and how safe they are. At the moment, the, the regulatory authorities, if, you want, if you're Boeing or Airbus or someone else and you want to uh, sell your aeroplane, you have to try and demonstrate to the best of your ability that you're only going to have a crash, a catastrophic incident, not never, but once in a billion flying hours, which is basically once in the life of the fleet. Okay? There are currently a billion cars on the roads, it is estimated. So if everybody bought a personal aerial vehicle, which I'm not suggesting we would, by the way, um, then we would have a crash once every hour. Okay. Now, we kill a few thousand people on the roads every year and we find that acceptable. Uh, air accidents at the moment are clearly less acceptable because they appear in the press. So there's going to have to potentially be a step change in the safety of these personal aerial vehicles. And the final one is, um, you're probably sitting there thinking, is he just talking about a helicopter? No, I'm not. Okay. So Daisy, if you could... Uh because helicopters take a long time to learn to fly, they're difficult to fly, and you wouldn't want uh, you know, the guy in the Corsa owning one of these. This is a famous YouTube video clip. Um, allegedly this guy's just, and I don't know the, the truth of this, but allegedly this guy's just bought a helicopter, he's waiting for the instructor, the instructor's late, and so he thinks, well, how hard can it be? I'm just gonna go flying. Okay. He does survive, the helicopter doesn't. All right. So we're not going to solve all of these issues uh, in, you know, in the duration of the project. We haven't got the resources to do that, but we are at least starting to think about it. 
Um, will this vision of the future come to pass? Well, I noted the other speakers were sort of literary types. I hope you don't mind, you mind me uh, des describing you as such. So I felt like I had to end with some quotations. All right. I've chosen Arthur C. Clarke, all right? So I read a lot of his books when I was a young lad, and he probably was the person who inspired me to go and study science and engineering. And they basically, you translate to, um, the top one is, everything's a bad idea until it becomes successful, and then I thought of it, all right? Um, well, if an elderly but distinguished scientist, I'm probably neither of those at this point, but you, know, you never know, says that something's possible, he's most probably right. But if he tells you it's impossible, the balance of probability says he's actually wrong. And finally, um, you know, I don't pretend to have all of the answers, but I hope you would agree we're trying to ask some of the right questions. So, those of you that went to the toilet, I hope it was satisfactory. Those of you that refreshed your drinks, I hope they weren't too overpriced. This is London. Those of you that stayed, thank you for listening.